Congratulations, Ed Husick. Thank you very much. The first industry minister I reported on was John Button. Mm -hmm. And uh, people might remember him cutting tariffs and transforming our steel, car, textile and clothing industries. The times have changed. How much capacity has an industry minister now to really change things? I think uh, if you look globally, industry policy has now come back to the fore in a fairly dramatic way as a result of COVID and also a range of geopolitical uh, pressures. And in our case, uh, having experienced through the pandemic the inability to get the things we needed at the time we needed them means that we do need to reconsider what our manufacturing capability is across sectors and how we uh, replenish and rebuild. Uh, in particular, not everything. We, can't, we simply cannot do everything, but there are key areas where we can make a difference, resources, agriculture, particularly in medical as well, and through that process deal with those supply chain vulnerabilities, uh, generate new economic opportunity and importantly secure work longer term. So there is a, an ability now more than days past, times past to do that. What's the role of government though? You've got some funds um, hmm. set aside to help uh, generate change, but what do they actually do? Uh, I, I would. Let, let me answer it in two ways. One is uh, from a specific policy way, but there's another important way as well. From a specific policy way, uh, if you look at what we announced with the National Reconstruction Fund, 15 billion, a sim similar architecture to the Clean Energy Financing Corporation, what that did in terms of spurring on renewable energy development in this country and making that a lot more commercial. So with the NRF, uh, looking at being able to provide capital, particularly at a time where you know, it's going to be harder to get that and to be able to have that available for industry as they're trying to uh, get ahead, be it in a whole range of areas, resources, agriculture, transport, as I said before. Um, what we do on government procurement, opening up government contracts to help in part strengthen industry outcomes, really important. But the bigger thing, the second thing that I sort of flagged is sending a signal to industry that government wants to be there on in partnership to rebuild capability, particularly at home, uh, and not just in terms of uh, having export opportunity, but be able to meet the needs of uh, businesses here and consumers as well. We often reflected on, uh, for example, the fact that Australia's manufacturing capacity, self-sufficiency, is probably the lowest in the OECD. That has an impact right now. You know, if you look at supply chain issues, um, labour shortages, the combining of that, what it does to inflation, there is a priority for us to get this sorted out as quickly as we can. It's a big challenge uh, and that's why we've, we've dedicated so much thought and resources to this. Uh, more immediately, of course, we've got this uh, uh, sort of spiralling energy mm. uh, cost problem, 400% uh, increases in wholesale gas prices, mm. huge increases in electricity prices. This looks like the first sort of economic crisis the new government faces. Mm. What can the government do? Can you and will you intervene in the short term to either uh, cap, pri cap exports or su supports in place for vulnerable businesses? Uh, I, it absolutely is critical. It's a big issue in talking, I've spent a lot of time in different parts of the country talking to industry, manufacturers, you know, industrial users. They represent nearly half of domestic gas demand. Uh, they want to be able to transition to new, cleaner, renewable sources of energy, but that transition is going to take some time. So, so when the gas prices go up, it's an issue. Um, well, we're going to, uh, well, obviously it's, you know, we've just been sworn in and we need to have the briefings and work with industry on that. Uh, that is going to be important. Today, you became the first Muslim to be appointed mm. as a cabinet minister. That's a huge moment for you and your family, but mm. also a significant moment for the country, isn't it? I think so. I think, um, at a broader level, I think it's, it, this is a good moment in time. You know, we have a cabinet that, not perfectly, but more broadly reflects the face of modern Australia, and that is nothing to uh, be sneezed at. I think it's, a, it's an important thing. Uh, for Muslim Australians as well, today, uh, it's not just about myself or my friend Ann Ali uh, being sworn in. It's, it's also a signal to them as well that uh, there's an opportunity for, in particular, I think of young Muslim Australians, you know, the door is not shut. And for those who thought that they'd always be relegated to the other, today they're part of the all. That's an important point. And yeah, it's been a bit of a trek and I, I'm very conscious post 
9-11, like over the, that period of time, you know, fear did drive a lot of reactions, understandably. But I think we're making these, this progress, these steps, and opening the door and saying to Australians of all backgrounds that you know, at one of the highest decision-making levels in the country, that you're welcome, you've got the opportunity, you can make a contribution, uh, is really important and should not be overlooked. And it's, it's, a, it's a really important moment in time. And what we do with it now, we'll, well, we'll be judged on that. But I think it's, it's some, it says something about the greatness of this country, that it's allowed people from different backgrounds to participate and make a difference. Well, good luck to you and thanks for your time tonight. Thank you for yours. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.